uh, we're going to do azaleas, camellias, and rhododendrons. That's in alphabetical order. Uh, it's kind of funny that we talk about them almost as one word, uh, and often uh, in books and articles, you see them all lumped together. Um, Azaleas and rhododendrons are very closely related. They're all in the genus rhododendron. Camellias are not related, uh, but they're all related culturally. Uh, so in gardening terms, uh, they share a lot of characteristics. And if we can prepare the garden for one, then we've prepared the garden for the other. And uh, I, I don't really mean to exclude other shade-loving, acid-loving plants. There are many of those, um, but we can't talk about everything. Uh, but we've left out, for instance, gardenias, uh, pyrrhus, uh, which I will talk about uh, a little bit. Uh, we've left out blue hydrangeas, uh, which need to be in an acid environment in order to be blue, for instance. Uh, but we're going to focus on the big three here, which are the most widely grown in the gardens. And uh, I think Shannon's right that maybe they uh, have fallen out of style a little bit. Um, I'm old fashioned enough to consider rhododendrons to be royalty of the garden. Uh, and uh, camellias are so widely grown that I don't think they can truly fall out of favor, but uh, maybe they've all had difficulty with the years of drought that we've experienced uh, with the exception of last year. And I think uh, people have had great difficulties with them during those very dry years because they do need irrigation during the summer in order to thrive. And during the times when we just couldn't pour water indiscriminately uh, on them, uh, they suffered. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, this opening slide is a picture that I took of rhododendron occidental, which is the Western azalea, uh, which grows natively in California and Oregon. Uh, this was taken in Sonoma County, and uh, uh, you can see in the open flower there that there are five, five stamens here, and having five stamens is what largely distinguishes azaleas from rhododendrons. Rhododendrons have ten, um, but they're all uh, in the same genus, and they're all kin. Uh, camellias, on the other hand, are in the tea family. Uh, Camellia japonica and Camellia sasanqua are the most widely grown garden camellias, but Camellia sinensis is tea. And all of the different teas that you, true teas that you drink from green teas to fermented teas and roasted teas uh, are all mostly Camellia sinensis. Um, we're going to, let's see here, have to share sort of how we're going to go through this. We're going to talk about rhododendrons, and then we're going to talk about evergreen azaleas and deciduous azaleas, deciduous meaning they lose their leaves in the winter, uh, and then uh, three sorts of camellias, the japonica, sasanquas, and hybrids, uh, and those are the plants that are most commonly available in your garden center or even uh, through mail order houses. Uh, and that you can expect to successfully grow in the garden. Um, there are, in fact, uh, a thousand different species of rhododendrons. They are worldwide in distribution, including even Australia. Um, uh, but you will probably only see 10 to 15 
different varieties at any one time, even in the height of the season in any particular uh, garden center location. Um, there used to be some rhododendron specialty uh, nurseries in the Bay Area, um, but they've all closed. Uh, and uh, so we we don't have the ability to drive up to Skyline Boulevard anymore in San Mateo County and and see all the uh, beautiful rhododendrons and pick one out and have them dig it out of the ground for us to uh, take home the way we once could. Um, now, uh, the outline mentions what azaleas, camellias, and rhododendrons have in common. Uh, and they're, they're simple ideas, but not so easy to carry out. The first is that they all like an acidic soil. Uh, and that means a pH between about 4.5 and 5.5 is their preferred pH. Um, our soils in the Bay Area, with very few exceptions, are not acidic. They're neutral to alkaline. They might be very slightly acidic, but not acidic the way these plants really prefer it. Um, our water, our domestic water supplies are always alkaline because if they're acidic, they eat up our pipes. And so um, their pH controlled to be on the alkaline side, and that then neutralizes even slightly acidic soils. Um, so that's our starting place uh, with our native soils. Um, I, I can recall driving from Portland down to California along the coast of Oregon and being uh, surprised to notice that all of the hydrangeas in everybody's yard as I drove along south uh, were blue uh, until I got about three quarters of the way south in Oregon and then suddenly they were pink and they were pink the rest of the way down through California. Uh, and that's because the soils in the northern part of Oregon and in Washington state are naturally acidic and that's why uh, rhododendrons in particular grow like weeds in places like Portland. Um, my son's rather modest house in east side of Portland uh, had a gigantic rhododendron that towered up over the house uh, and had very little care other than the natural rainfall that came down. Um, we don't have that luxury here, so we have to prepare the soil to be a little bit acidic. And we do that by adding lots of organic matter. Uh, if you are lucky enough to be able to compost your own oak leaves, uh, oak leaf mold is a wonderful acidic addition to soil. Uh, peat moss, of course, is acidic, but peat moss does not make a very good addition to soil because when it gets dry it's extremely difficult to get it wet again and uh, so it, it's uh, it's okay as an element in a potting soil a rather small element in a potting soil uh, where natural uh, soil moisteners can be added they're they're actually cactus products so that help things re-wet and are usually used in potting soils, but you can't really do that in your garden soil. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend peat moss, but uh, commercially available compost, um, which is more and more available now that we're all putting our plant materials in the green cans and they're being commercially composted, um, we can get that back in the form of uh, either the giveaways that the composters or the cities do, or uh, Sloat, for instance, has uh, bagged compost uh, that's very high quality and will help uh, prepare the soil for plants like azaleas, camellias, and rhododendrons. Um, it's also good to keep a heavy mulch around these plants 
Um, it'll slowly decompose. It slowly adds humic acids that uh, improve the soil texture and acidify a little bit. And we won't ever get a pH between four and a half and five and a half, but if we can get it between five and a half and six and a half, the plants will be happy enough uh, for our garden needs. Uh, we also have to worry a little bit about sun exposure. Uh, all of these plants prefer protection from the hot midday summer sun. Uh, midday summer sun would be from about 11 in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and all of them can suffer from leaf burn uh, or sun scorch uh, if they don't have protection from the sun during the summer. In the winter, it's really not a problem. Uh, and I've successfully grown all of these plants in full sun um, but it requires a lot of attention and, uh, and more water than we probably want to use these days to be able to do that. Um, so we need to find dappled shade during the day or a morning sun exposure, ideally. Uh, late afternoon sun is not as effective as morning sun. Um, I, don't ask me why, I don't know. Um, the water needs are fairly substantial with all of these plants. Uh, these are not plants from dry summer climates or Mediterranean climates, as we call them. Um, every place where rhododendrons, camellias, and azaleas are native, they receive moisture during the summer, either uh, in the form of rain, uh, or in the case of, for instance, the Western azalea that I showed you the picture of, uh, they grow along stream beds uh, where there is constant moisture. Um, and so uh, rhododendrons are native to uh, uh, Asia. The Himalayan foothills are one of the hotbeds of rhododendrons. And uh, they're always in areas that get summer rain. Uh, same with azaleas. Uh, a lot of azaleas are from China and Japan. Um, and the camellias as well, largely Asian. And summer summer rain is typical. Uh, camellias uh, have a different root system than azaleas and rhododendrons. Azaleas and rhododendrons have a very, very fibrous, um, you might call it light in the sense that they don't develop big, heavy, thick roots. Um, they're all very tiny and they uh, make a, a, a web that's very dense, um, but they don't have a tap root that goes way down into the ground. Uh, and they're not capable of uh, reaching groundwater uh, in in the areas where we live anyway. Um, camellias are a little different because they will develop very root, very deep root systems. And I have experienced them uh, being able to go through a summer without any water here. Uh, once they're quite mature, um, this means probably they're five to 10 years old and uh, most of them would be eight to 10 feet tall, probably. Uh, and, and at that point, they're capable of making it through a summer, although you probably will witness some leaf curl as, as they dry. Uh, and they may be more susceptible to some insects and diseases uh, if they're under uh, drought stress, but they will survive for the most part. Um, in containers, and these are all very worthy container subjects, um, we usually use a bagged um, acidic soil mix. Um, that's fairly easy to make using some added sulfur and added uh, peat moss to the uh, soil mix. And so uh, a 
product like this is the EB stone, azalea, camellia, and acid mix. Uh, they keep changing the names, but um, sometimes the rhododendrons are on there and sometimes they fall off. Sometimes the gardenias are on there and sometimes they fall off. But this is the type of mix you want to use uh, if you're going to grow any of these in containers. Uh, and as I say, they, they all uh, grow very well in containers. Even the larger camellias can grow their whole life in a container as long as it ends up being pretty big and you have to keep them trimmed a little bit so they don't get, well, the, the top of the plant, the leaf structure has to be in proportion to the root area that you have available for it. So you need to do some pruning and, and trimming on them to keep them to a good size. Also, uh, every few years, and that could be maybe five years at the most, um, they should be knocked out of their pot once they're at mature size, knock them out of the pot, trim the roots back, trim the top back, and repot them with some fresh soil, and you can keep them in pots for their entire lives. Um, if you're going to fertilize them, and you should definitely fertilize them in containers and probably in the ground, uh, on the left here is the EB stone acid fertilizer, which will help keep the soil slightly acid. Um, it has added sulfur in it. Um, basically, soil sulfur becomes sulfuric acid, very dilute sulfuric acid, and helps keep the soil uh, acidic. And um, sulpo mag is a naturally occurring uh, mineral that uh, contains sulfur, potassium, and magnesium. Uh, and it, it has a lot of potassium, that 0020 that's on the bag there means there's no nitrogen, there's no phosphorus, but there's 20% potassium in there. Uh, fortunately, it's pretty well tied up in the mineral and it's not going to over potassium anything. Uh, and uh, this is a, a good product to add a little bit of, of uh, acidity safely uh, to a soil. Um, it, it's an alternative uh, also to, you may read from time to time that you should add Epsom salts to various things, various plants. Um, Epsom salts is largely potassium. Um, but uh, this is a safer uh, and more manageable way to get that potassium to the plant and to add some acidity uh, to the soil in a safe way uh, that won't overdo it. Uh, so I I recommend Soul Mag for the acid lovers, definitely. And some of the root vegetables that are pictured here uh, can benefit from it uh, as well. Um, We probably uh, want to fertilize the acid lovers that are in containers about monthly uh, from the time that the, the flowers have opened uh, through about this time of the year, the end of October. Uh, by the end of October, the plants should have finished flowering, put on some new growth, and made some flower buds for the next season. Uh, and there's no need then to fertilize them. Uh, we don't want to stimulate growth at this point because that could cause the flowers to partially open prematurely. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll let them rest in a sense until it's time to open up uh, in winter and spring. Now, Having said that, I noticed that some of the Sasanqua camellias, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, are already opening up here. Uh, I usually think them think of them as opening more in uh, December, um, but um, some of them are starting to bloom right now. And uh, so uh, I would uh, 
probably back off on the fertilizer. Uh, if your plants look like they're ready to pop, let them pop. They, they have a mind of their own and a timetable of their own. Um, I don't know if this is a real picture or not, um, but um, rhododendrons in the, uh, the, maybe this is a fantasy of rhododendrons in the Himalayan uh, foothills. Um, I, I'm imagining myself trekking through Nepal through forests of rhododendrons with Mount Everest or whatever that might be uh, in the background. Um, but that is the idea. Uh, uh, rhododendrons do grow to tree size, uh, some of the uh, of the species, uh, as, as much as 100 feet tall. Uh, and some of them have ridiculously large flowers, uh, six inches in diameter, um, the tropical ones. Um, but, but this is uh, maybe a fever dream of uh, trekking through Nepal through the uh, rhododendrons. Um, I think of them as royalty uh, because of their absolutely stunning form and their amazing colors. Um, this is Anna Krushki, uh, a hybrid rhododendron uh, that's been around a long time. Uh, one of the most wonderful of the garden rhododendrons. Um, and uh, the, the flower bud just started to open over here, gives you a wonderful uh, idea of the tiered nature of the bloom. Uh, and then, the, of course, the flowers open up into these five-petaled wonders with the ten stamens in there, uh, which uh, tells you that it's uh, a rhododendron, not an azalea. Uh, the leaves are, for the most part, smooth on the top. Their edges are smooth, unlike uh, most uh, azaleas have hairy leaves. And... Um, uh, the rhododendrons uh, give you colors from whites through pinks, through purples, to deep purple, to almost blue, uh, and pale, pale yellow. Um, they do not give you oranges or really bright pinks. Um, those are limited to the deciduous azaleas, which we'll look at. Um, this is Anna Rose Whitney. Um, this is another old one. Um, it uh, does very well around here, uh, if you can find it. Um, it's a big rhododendron. Uh, it'll grow 8 to 10 feet. Uh, and the form of rhododendrons and azaleas is roughly symmetrical. Um, they bloom on the ends of the new growth. Uh, so a branch will come out, it'll form a flower bud, and then the flowers will come out, and then the growth has to come out below that. Uh, and so they branch, and then they bloom again, and then they branch some more. And this makes them, generally speaking, about as tall as they are wide. Um, so you can figure that if... Um, there's information about a given rhododendron and it says it's going to be four to six feet tall. It's also going to be four to six feet wide for the most part. Um, this gives you an idea of some of the subtleties uh, in colors that some of the rhododendrons have. This is unique. Um, it's the name of the, of the variety. It's a hybrid rhododendron. And you can see the almost yellow creamy yellow in the center, the white, uh, the pink on the back of the bud as before it opens. Um, just uh, a wonderful combination of very subtle colors um, that can just pop right out at you. And uh, you you say to yourself, wow, how how does it do that? But as I say, you can't you can't get some of the more stunning colors, which we'll look at in a minute. Now, here I just I lined up three sizes of rhododendrons in the garden center for you um, so that um, you get an idea both 
of how they grow. So you can see the the kind of symmetry, the roundness, even even of the smaller one. Um, this is a two gallon over here. This is a five gallon. These are all what we call nominal sizes because we we give them names, but they're they're not truly the volume of the containers. Uh, so two gallon, five gallon, fifteen gallon. Obviously, the price goes up as you get to the bigger ones. And you can see, though, that they've all got flower buds on them. Um, the big one has a nice, big, fat flower bud here. Uh, and the smaller one over here has numerous flower buds. So you're looking for a big, kind of swollen bud. Uh, here's another one here, as opposed to these skinnier buds, which are probably just leaf buds. Now, this one might grow into a flower bud, but these two are clearly uh, leaf buds that are going to grow foliage. Uh, and there are leaf buds all around down here below the flower bud, which are going to come out after the flower is finished blooming. Um, and you can see the kind of dull green. Um, there, most rhododendrons are not shiny. Uh, some are almost shiny, like this one. Um, but they're not uh, brilliant shiny uh, the way a gardenia is, for instance. Um, but even the tiniest one here has some nice big flower buds that will bloom the first year that you get it, which is really nice. Uh, and of course, it's always good to buy them when they're actually in bloom, uh, because then you know exactly what you're getting in terms of color and form. And that will usually happen in the uh, late winter to early spring, sometime between uh, February and uh, March, uh, or the end of March or April. Uh, and so, you, you know, keep going back, keep your eyes open on the rhododendron section and uh, you'll be lucky enough to see see some samples of them when they open up and uh, you can see what you like better than some better than others probably uh, here uh, I, I lined up some of the rhododendrons cousins the azaleas in different sizes um, how do I get rid of this bar hmm I don't know. Um, one gallon, two gallon, five gallon azaleas. And you can see they have a very similar form, but they have smaller leaves. Uh, they will bloom on the ends of the branches, just like the rhododendrons. And then they'll branch out and again, make symmetrical growth so that you can figure they'll be roundish and some are very compact, like this little Karumi azalea here, and some are uh, put on more vigorous growth each time they grow out, and so they become more open, uh, not quite as compact, uh, but they'll still be covered with flowers uh, when they bloom in the spring. Uh, so you can get an idea of how you know, they're they're extremely compatible in terms of the look between them. Uh, they're not identical, uh, which is always good, but they share enough characteristics that it's pleasing to the eye uh, to put them together. Um, the leaf shape is similar, but not identical. The texture is similar, but not identical. And of course, the flowering will be different because unlike the mechanical of flowers that the rhododendrons make, uh, the azaleas make uh, clusters of flowers, but they're not in a dome shape the way the uh, rhododendron is. And azaleas come in a myriad of shapes and colors. Um, the Belgian indica azaleas were originally grown for greenhouse forcing to make them bloom around the holidays, basically. Um, they have round, shiny, rounded end, ends and, and relatively shiny leaves. And many of them have these ruffled double flowers. 
and are bicolored like this, but you'll also find them in white, plain white, pink, red, uh, salmon. Um, and uh, they can grow very nicely in the garden as well. Uh, they need some shade. And uh, it's usually best not to just take them when they're in bloom, when you find them at the florist or at the, at the garden center. You don't want to just plop them into the ground. Um, they have been babied in greenhouses to get them to bloom in a timely way for the market. And they need to have a period of adjustment before they go into the garden. So the thing to do is to put them uh, in a shady spot, maybe next to the house, where they'll get a little bit of uh, protection from the cold. Um, you, even though azaleas are extremely hardy, when they anything has been grown in a very controlled atmosphere, like a greenhouse, uh, they haven't hardened off. The leaves don't have the structure that a plant growing all its life in the outdoors has. It's kind of like you and I, if, if we're used to the summer weather and we suddenly get some cold nights like we've had, they, they feel awfully cold, even though it's only, you know, 40 degrees. This isn't 10 degrees, uh, but it feels much colder than it has been. Well, same for the plants. They... Uh, they haven't uh, uh, developed the tissues in the leaves that can help them deal with the cold well. And so give them a little protection until springtime and then put them out in the garden in the springtime and they will do very well and come back and flower year after year, uh, even though they were uh, designed for, for greenhouse forcing. That's the Belgian indica. They're fairly compact. They have a fairly limited color range, uh, but they're widely available. And you'll even see them probably at CVS and, and the like uh, close to Christmas time. Uh, the Southern indica azaleas, this is one called Formosa, were developed uh, to take uh, heat basically. Uh, and they can also handle a lot of sunshine. Uh, now, that doesn't mean full sun all day, uh, but they can handle more sun than almost any other strain of azalea. And so if you have a spot that uh, is a little overly sunny, you think, um, they're worth a try. Uh, they'll still need plenty of water. They can't have both hot sun and dry roots. Um, they won't survive that, but they they will survive a lot of sun without scorching, and they'll bloom very well. And there are a number of uh, varieties of southern indicas, um, and they'll usually, usually on azalea labels, it will say azalea, and then it'll have the strain. So it'll say indica or southern indica, it might say Belgian indica, or karumi or satsuki. And this gives you uh, an insight into their parentage, basically. Uh, so the Southern Indicas were Belgian Indicas that were hybridized with other species of or varieties of azaleas uh, and that uh, can handle more sun. And this is, uh, this is one called George Tabor, one of my favorites, um, a really lovely and uh, profusely blooming uh, azalea. The Southern Indicas tend to be kind of tall. Uh, they can get up to four, four feet quite easily. Uh, and, uh, and the flowers are relatively large. Uh, if you want something that's a little more petite, uh, the Karumi azaleas are among my favorites. Uh, they have very small flowers, and and their growth habits are very very compact, uh, and and they have a color range from white through pink through almost orange and red. Uh, there are some purples; they're kind of light purple, uh, and. Uh, they need a little, well, quite a bit more shade than the Southern Indicas 
They don't do well in the hot sun, uh, but they can be really effective uh, border plants when you want a relatively low border, uh, maybe to knee high, uh, but not to waist high the way the Southern Indicas would get. Uh, Kurumi azaleas uh, are used in bonsai. Um, I have no idea how old this one must be. I was lucky enough to see a, an azalea bonsai exhibition when I was in Kyoto uh, one year, and uh, they can be absolutely spectacular. So if you have uh, some time on your hands and maybe a few generations after you to work on it after you're gone, um, you can create something like this as well. Uh, ha ha. Now, how do we get a color like this? Uh, there's only one way, and that's with a deciduous azalea. Uh, this is an Exbury hybrid azalea called Klondike. Uh, if that's not spectacular, I don't know what is. Uh, deciduous azaleas lose their leaves in the winter, um, and they bloom usually, well, I will say more than half of them bloom before they put on the leaves in the spring. So they are just covered with flowers, uh, but no leaves, and then the leaves grow out. Some of them grow the leaves and the flowers at virtually the same time, uh, but they're still spectacular. Uh, among my favorite shrubs, um, unfortunately, the deer seem to like them. They especially like the flower buds. Um, so I grow mine uh, in containers on a protected deck um, so that the deer can't eat them. Uh, most rhododendrons, by the way, are pretty deer resistant. Um, the deer may nibble them a little bit, but they don't eat them a lot. They will eat the azaleas, including the deciduous azaleas. So that's another difference besides the five stamens between rhododendrons and azaleas. Um, if you wander, if you're in a deer neighborhood and you wander the neighborhood, you will probably see some rhododendrons successfully growing, but not too many azaleas out in the open. Uh, this is another pretty spectacular deciduous azalea whose colors you won't find in any of the rhododendrons or evergreen azaleas. Um, this is Cannon's Double, another Exbury azalea. Exbury is the Rothschild estate in uh, England. Uh, and the first Baron Rothschild was uh, an azalea fan and used uh, a number of species of uh, deciduous azaleas to make these hybrids, which are just spectacular. The, they, they were based on another group of uh, similar hybrids called the Knapp Hill hybrids. Um, and they're they're very similar. If you can find any Nap Hill hybrids or Exbury hybrids, um, try them out. Um, Monrovia grows several varieties of the Exbury azaleas. You can look them up on their uh, website. And uh, garden centers sometimes get them in, maybe not in very uh, great numbers. Um, ask your garden center to get you one if you want. Um, or Monrovia has a, uh, a service where you can buy through their website and then um, have it delivered to your local garden center if, if they do business with Monrovia. Um, this is a, another picture of our native deciduous azalea, Rhododendron occidental. Um, it is just a lovely, lovely, subtle, delicate uh, shrub uh, that you can successfully grow in the garden, but it's hard to find them. Uh, you could try Calflora nursery, uh, or if you have a, a, a local native plant nursery, they may sometimes have them in. And there are a couple of, of uh, hybrids that 
have been developed in a couple of selections that have names that uh, are have very pretty flowers. But um, if you're interested in growing native plants, this is worth uh, searching for and trying to find a spot for in your garden. Again, some shade, some water, uh, and try to make lots of organic matter in the soil. Uh, I, I think I neglected to talk about the importance of drainage for the uh, rhododendrons and azaleas in particular. Uh, it really has to be good. Uh, they can't be in standing water. And uh, I've successfully grown rhododendrons by just setting them on top of the ground. You take them out of their pot. You don't really fiddle with the roots much on them because the roots are so fibrous. You set it on top of the ground and then you mound a, a, a porous soil mix up around them and they do just fine. It's a little difficult to water them. You sort of have to trickle water them so that it doesn't just run off of them uh, during the summer. Uh, but the drainage is good and they don't have root problems that way. Uh, I've, I've found that a mixture of lava rock and uh, fir bark uh, with a little bit of fertilizer and it works very well uh, in, in that mounding situation. So no mineral soil at all, just lava rock and fir bark and a little bit of fertilizer and uh, mound it up around them. Now, camellias, I better hurry along here. Uh, Camellia japonica is the most common camellia you see. It has big flowers, big shiny leaves, and grows oh, as tall as 12 to 14 feet. Uh, not as wide as tall generally. And the flowers, when they're finished, fall off in one piece, uh, kaplunk. Um, they come in a range of colors that is and flower shapes that are pretty spectacular. Um, Tom Knudsen here is a, almost a grotesque. It's so red and so fleshy looking, um, but it's a beautiful Camellia uh, japonica. Uh, this is a double flower, um, Nuccio's pearl. This is what we call a rose double. Uh, completely double flower. All of those yellow stamens that were in the middle of silver waves have become petals uh, in the case of a fully double flower. And uh, the colors are pretty spectacular here. Uh, the camellias can take a little more sun than a lot of the azaleas and rhododendrons, but again, keep them out of the midday hot summer sun. Uh, and uh, they are really easy to grow. Um, they're highly adaptable. And as I said earlier, they will develop a deep root system that becomes somewhat drought tolerant with time. The Sasanqua camellias are usually simpler looking. This is a, a simple single flower in Yuletide, um, a pretty spectacular coral pink. Uh, that blooms very early. They're starting to bloom right now. Uh, Sasanquas have smaller leaves. They're usually a little smaller plant, maybe to eight to 10 feet, typically. Uh, and uh, they can take more sun than the japonicas. Uh, but again, some protection from the hottest midday sun is prudent. Uh, Setsugeka is another Sasanqua. It's gorgeous, white, but it always has somewhere in the petal this little touch of pink. Uh, it can be a stripe, it can be edges, it can be in the back of the petal, but there's always some pink in Setsugeka. And it's very early. Uh, these are also starting to bloom now. Uh, as uh, is apple blossom. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the prettiest of the Sasanquas, uh, quite early. Uh, and uh, Sasanquas, when they're finished blooming, the flowers, instead of falling off kerplunk the way the Japonicas do, they fall off in pieces. 
Uh, so the petals fall off and the stamens usually stay on and dry up. Uh, they make a little more of a mess, um, but they have the advantage of not getting camellia petal blight as much as the japonicas do, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, this is a typical camellia bud, flower bud, and a leaf bud. So when you're out shopping, uh, look for a fat bud like this one next to a skinny one like this one, and you'll know you've got a flower bud there that is going to open up into a flower for you this coming season. Uh, if you don't see any flower buds on the plant by this time of year, it's probably not going to bloom the first year you get it. And don't be shocked uh, if you find structures like this on a camellia. This is a seed pod. Uh, often, uh, some varieties make more seed pods than others. They probably just pollinate more easily. Uh, and inside this round fruit, there are usually three kind of nut-like brown seeds. Uh, and you can just take these off if you want to, or you can leave them on and they'll dry up and open up and the seeds will fall out. Occasionally they'll sprout uh, and you'll have a baby plant that is uh, gonna be genetically very different from the one that it dropped off of. Um, at the nursery, you'll find one gallon, two gallon, five gallon, 15 gallon camellias. So size difference, obviously, and significant price difference from maybe $25 for the one gallon to close to $400 for the 15 gallon. Um, but uh, there are a couple, hmm, a couple of years growth difference between each size here. Um, so you're getting uh, something for your money uh, when you get the bigger size. And if you have an area that requires a large one, um, you'll know that they're available. Um, this is the dreaded camellia petal blight. Uh, it's a fungal disease that attacks the petals uh, and turns them brown. And the main way that you avoid it is by cleaning up the petals when the flowers drop off. And uh, good hygiene usually uh, avoids this problem. And putting a layer of mulch after it's all finished flowering and you've cleaned all the leaves and the petals up, uh, put a good couple inch layer of mulch and that will help keep any spores that are in the soil from getting up into next year's uh, flower buds. Uh, they actually get up there before they open and are ready to go as soon as the flowers open. And they, they start with a little round brown patch and then take over the uh, entire flower, but you can avoid it. Um, all right, Let's see if we can move here. I think I'm I'm at the end of the slides. All right, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a, another kind of azalea that is becoming more and more available, uh, called a reblooming azalea. Uh, they come uh, with names like Encore and Bloomathon, um, and are being um, I would say marketed fairly heavy, heavily these days. Uh, they do rebloom. Uh, they'll bloom in the spring and then they grow a little bit and they form buds and they bloom again. Uh, I think they don't bloom quite as heavily in the first flush of blooms uh, as some of the older varieties of azaleas, but they can give you a, a longer blooming period uh, than you would traditionally get with azaleas. And uh, their color range is fairly limited. The encores have more colors than the bloomathons. Bloomathons are pretty much limited to white, pink, and red at this point. Uh, there are lavender and uh, kind of salmon-colored uh, encores in addition to the pink, white, and red. Um, but uh, I guess if I if I have a criticism of them, it's that 
the form of the flowers and the form of the shrubs are all the same. Uh, so they lack variety in that sense. Uh, and so I, I don't um, personally want them to take over the world. Uh, I think there's a place for them, uh, but there are many, many interesting forms of azaleas that uh, should, should be part of the garden. Uh, and we don't uh, we, we don't want to be too homogenous uh, in the way we go about it. Um, let's see. Well, uh, how are we doing question wise, Shannon? Okay, so we've had a couple of questions um, a lot about, and I acknowledge that this presentation is not specifically on like pruning and repotting and kind of care and maintenance of um, roadies and azaleas and camellias. So I've had a couple of questions of just like timing on pruning and or repotting. Um, sure. Maybe you could speak to that. And then the last thing that I've seen a couple of times, and it's something we talk about often in our nursery, is that um, we say that camellias are more of a shade plant or a morning sun, afternoon shade plant. And yet, you know, if you drive around some of the areas, especially out here in um, in in Danville and in the East Bay area, you know, you have massive camellias that are sitting right in the middle of open sun, you know, so we talk a lot about the difference in what our climate is versus when those were probably planted, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if you have any thoughts on that heat capability of, of camellias or any of these, but I guess camellias specifically, and then just a couple of thoughts on timing for repotting, moving, um, pruning, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, pruning uh, should be done shortly after flowering uh, with all of these uh, because you need a period of growth uh, to form the flower buds for the next season. Uh, so you don't want to do it while the flower buds are have already formed or you're just removing flower buds. Uh, so as soon as the flowering is finished, um, usually with rhododendrons. Uh, once the flowers are finished, you're left with a, a stalk that's a kind of funny looking stalk with the uh, pistols uh, uh, kind of sticking out and you, you snap that off uh, above the leaf buds, and then the leaf buds will flush out. But if you want to shorten the plant at that point, you can go back to an earlier ring of buds uh, and leaves uh, and cut back to that, and then those buds will leaf out. Uh, what you don't want to do with rhododendrons is cut into bare wood because usually there are no dormant buds in the bare wood. Once it's made bark, basically, uh, it's not going to leaf out from that point. So you want to be a little careful not to go past where there are functioning leaves. Every leaf axle where the leaf attaches to the stem will have a potential leaf bud in it. And so you can go back to where there are, are leaves. Um, on camellias, um, again, after they've flowered, um, you can cut them back at will, basically. Um, they often will uh, sprout out from even from bare wood, although you seldom have to cut them back to bare wood. Um, but you can definitely cut the stems back and then they will uh, send out new growth and form buds uh, in that same season uh, so that you'll have flowers for the next year. And in terms of repotting, the very best time uh, is uh, after they've uh, set their flower buds, but before they bloom. Uh, so they're kind of in a quiescent state where they're not actively growing uh, and they're not actively blooming, um, but they've done their work for the summer. This would, this would be in late summer to early fall. Uh, 
when they're kind of quiet and you can pop them out of their container, uh, either transplant or uh, put them back in the same container or another container. Uh, you can trim the roots back lightly at that point because you're not going to trim the top back at that point. Uh, the other time to re repot them, it would be in the spring after they've flowered uh, when it's natural to trim the top back. And then you can also trim the roots back and uh, repot them. So either of those times will work fine. Uh, with the rhododendrons, when you repot them, don't fool much with the with the roots. They may look like they're kind of root bound, but that's the natural way the roots grow. Very tiny, very come sort of packed in, uh, and you really don't want to scrape around too much on them. I, I usually just scarify the outsides of the roots uh, of rhododendrons and azaleas very lightly um, so that there's a little more connection with the new soil uh, and, and that's it. Um, in terms of the sun exposure, yeah, I've, I've seen them growing in the Central Valley out in the open. Um, I, I think um, that the likely fact is in, in those settings is that um, I, I haven't seen young ones. Um, I've seen big ones. Uh, I think they have very deep roots. I think there must be some groundwater. Uh, and uh, these are uh, Camellia japonica that I've seen. So they are um, the, the type of Camellia that warrants a little more shade than the Sasanquas, and yet they're growing out in the open. Uh, I've seen that as well. Um, I suspect that the flowers um, are susceptible of getting um, burned, um, but they probably bloom so profusely that it doesn't matter. Uh, but I would not recommend putting a young camellia uh, out in the full sun with the kinds of conditions that we have now. Uh, the groundwater is disappearing. Um, the ability to water them deeply is limited. And so you're probably going to have much better success if you can give them some protection. Um, if you have your own well and you have a high water table, uh, what the heck, it's worth a try. Um, but, um, you know, a, we're going to have more years of drought ahead of us. Um, that's just reality. And you're probably not going to be successful getting one to grow big out in the open um, without pouring a lot of water on it. You mentioned like kind of that sun scalding. Is there anything, one of the questions was, you know, is there something that can be done about that sun scorch, like how to help a camellia specifically, but I guess any of them really to recover from, from sun, sun scorch? Say that five times fast. That's, yeah, that's right, sun scorch. <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of anything that can help them recover. The sun scorch uh, usually shows up as a brown, blotch on the leaf uh, and it it doesn't spread. Uh, it's not a disease that's going to take over the plant. The leaf is still making food for the plant. So you don't want to take the scorched leaves off necessarily. Uh, and upper leaves are also shading lower leaves. So the, the ones that get scorched are probably saving some of the ones underneath. Um, so you're probably best off to just leave it alone. Um, there are anti-desiccant products that might be worth a shot um, if you know that you have a susceptible plant and you're going to have a heat wave. Um, it, it it might be worth spraying it with an anti-desiccant. They're the kind of thing you put on uh, Christmas trees to keep them from drying out. Um, and uh, they have names like wilt stop. Um, it might protect the leaf a little bit, but uh, I, I think, uh, you know, that 
that's a big ask um, to uh, to keep them from scorching when it gets really hot. They they have big leaves that are not designed to uh, withstand that kind of exposure. Yeah. Okay, I know you have a couple more points on there to finish up. Um, you already talked a little uh, bit about fertilizing, well, right? So let's we'll talk a little bit about other things that grow well with camellias, azaleas, and rhododendrons. Um, if you want to make some dappled shade, uh, uh, you can grow trees like dogwoods and uh, uh, Japanese maples. Uh, they also like an acidic soil and they like lots of organic matter in the soil uh, and are extremely compatible with all of these plants. Um, and in terms of uh, sort of lower level plants to give you some variety, uh, things like Oregon grape, that's uh, Mahonia, uh, which is a, a native shrub that grows very nicely in anywhere from sun to almost full shade, uh, likes the acidic soil and likes a little bit of moisture, gives a nice yellow flower and a blue berry. Um, Sarcococa, which is known as sweet box, is uh, a shrub that will give you some real contrast in terms of the shape. Uh, it gives a, a fragrant white flower in the in the winter, which is really pleasing. Um, the hookeras or different kinds of coral bells are grown mostly for their foliage color, um, but they do very well in shade and uh, look really nice with the shiny leaves, uh, particularly of the camellias, and then you get the kind of uh, fall color uh, shades of the hookeras growing around them. I think they look fabulous. Um, you can even grow boxwood compatibly with them. You probably don't want to trim the boxwood into a formal shape the way they're sometimes used, but boxwoods are acid lovers, and if they're left natural, they're um, they're really a pleasing shrub uh, that likes the shade, although it can grow out in full sun and uh, makes a very natural looking uh, small leafed companion for azaleas and rhododendrons and camellias. Um, they wouldn't look good trimmed into a box hedge with them probably, uh, although I can, I can see that in some situations. Um, most of the ground covers that you'll find at the nursery will work fine with them. Uh, things like the Corsican mint or even the uh, ornamental strawberries uh, grow fine in quite a bit of shade. Uh, and uh, so you can kind of cover some of the ground. I, I wouldn't have them growing right up to the trunk. You don't want to keep the trunks of these plants. Uh, uh, you don't want to smother them so they don't have good air circulation. So you don't want to ground cover right up to their right up to their neck. Um, but around them uh, in the, under the leaves is fine. Um, you'll mostly uh, uh, have aphid problems with um, camellias in the spring. Uh, they, they can only do so much dirt to a camellia. Um, sometimes they'll distort the leaf buds a, a little bit, but uh, usually uh, once the aphids get started, the predatory insects will come along and take care of them. You can blow them off with a stream of water, or you can use a little bit of a soap spray, a horticultural soap spray, and take care of aphids without any problem. Uh, and with the uh, rhododendrons and azaleas, uh, we had a lot of problems during the drought years with thrip on them. Uh, it's very hard to control when they're under drought stress. And so if, if you're unable to irrigate them for a period of years, the way people were, um, it, it can become a problem and we'll probably be fighting them again. Um, but 
you know, prioritize the azaleas and rhododendrons in terms of uh, irrigation water uh, during drought periods and uh, to make sure that they're not so stressed that the thrips take over again. Uh, we, we saw thrips on plants that never seemed to have them before, like uh, ferns um, during those years. And uh, rhododendrons were very, very stressed during that period. Um, root rot is usually only a problem if the drainage is bad. And again, um, either raise them up or just assure that you have lots of organic matter in the soil and that the soil doesn't have standing water during the winter. Um, uh, that will be death for most of the azaleas and rhododendrons, but um, hopefully you don't have too many low spots like that. Uh, clay soil is only a problem if it's not modified. So again, uh, lots of organic matter and always plant them a little bit high so that the crown where the stem meets the soil is raised up an inch or so, so that that part can dry out during the wet periods. 